Happy Sabbath. We are the Tarango family. We are glad you joined us today. When doctors told Resta he had type 2 diabetes, he didn't know exactly what to do. He was immediately put on three medications, and none of them seemed to help. Eventually, Resta visited a nearby Adventist healthcare clinic. At the clinic, they taught me how to change my lifestyle, and since then I don't take any medication. I eat a vegan diet, and I work out a lot. Resta's health transformation inspired him to attend the Adventist University in Hungary to get certified in lifestyle consultation. Because I have diabetes, I really want to help other people with this disease. That's my motivation. Today, Resta is the coordinator of a global mission urban center of influence in Debrecen, the second largest city in Hungary. This center provides a number of services, including a salt room, therapeutic massage, medical advice for asthma and lung problems, and grief and addiction counseling. From the first moment they come here, we tell them everything is based on Christianity. Our base is the Bible. The Christian care and professional services visitors receive encourage them to return for other programs. We are very lucky because God gave us six doctors who are church members and also more than 10 members who are working in the healthcare field. I think it's a good opportunity for us to help people and work together for people. I think it's a very important place because in church we can treat the spiritual health of people and here we can treat the body and give them advice about the body. I think this place is like a bridge between the people of the city and the church. This urban center of influence started through total member involvement when Anna Maria decided to open a small bookstore where people could relax, socialize, and browse faith-based books. People don't have proper connections with each other. They are just rushing all the time. We were trying to reach out to those people who didn't have proper and pure connections with others. We wanted to pray with them and for them. Through this ministry, several people have come to know Jesus. There's a woman who had several problems and came into the store. I was able to recommend some books and support. We talked and I invited her to church and she became a church member. It was like a miracle how much of a loving atmosphere there was. They were very kind to me. They offered for me to sit down and talk with them. I'm very thankful for this center, and I'm thankful I can share my new beliefs and love with others. Another way Adventists spread love is through their annual event called Reach Out with Flowers. Each year, one of the church members grows thousands of daffodils on his land and donates them for all the church members to give out freely in the community. Many people ask why we do this. The answer is simple just because we want to show love and be a blessing to people in the city. Adventists and Debrecen are trying to connect with people in creative ways, whether it's through medical services or partnering in city events. They want to be involved in the community. Please pray that their outreach efforts continue to spread the love of Jesus to the people of this large city. Thank you for supporting Global Mission, which supports projects like these in cities around the world. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, morning. happy Sabbath uh, to all you out there. We welcome our viewers who are watching us today to have our conduct our Sabbath school panel. Uh, today, our discussion is about Bible as history, which is very interesting. I know how many of you guys are history buffs? I love history as much as probably the next person does too. Uh, let me introduce to you guys our participants. In a screen, I am. My name is Rio Pugal. I am the moderator, and also just below my screen is Ruth Charles. Um, 
And then below her is Moses Priego. And below him is Joseph Matundi. Um, Matunda, sorry. The, our, it's kind of funny, we were making light of this earlier that it seems like it's a healthcare uh, group uh, panel discussion. Um, more specifically, University Medical Center, <laughs> uh, hospital clinical staff, uh, aside from me. But let us continue with our study by uh, opening a word of prayer. Let us bow our heads and I'll say a word of prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Sabbath day, this beautiful Sabbath day you've given us. Uh, even though in the midst of what's going on around the world, we thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to still come together and study your word, especially today when it is about your history, your story, um, your, your story and your, your plans for, for us and our salvation, Lord. We pray that you move, send us Holy Spirit and move, move us and open our hearts to your word. Listen to them and heed them and follow them. In, faith. in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, the topic is about Bible as history. <clears throat> and um, you know, one of the things, so when, before I moved to El Paso, we went out, uh, Irish and I uh, went to uh, Europe for almost a, a month, just uh, experiencing uh, you know, London, England, Paris, uh, uh, Venice, uh, Florence, uh, Italy, Rome, um, but we didn't we didn't go see like the how the younger sites like the the, the, the district, the shopping malls, the one we actually visit uh, the history, especially the ancient history of each one of those locations, and it's just so awe inspiring how you can look at how people lived back then and and understand where why we have a world today uh, the world today as it is now, um, so. Moses, my first, uh, my question to you is, you know, Bible is history. Why is history so important to learn, and, and specifically biblical history? You know, when, when you're opening up the session, you're saying that it was exciting. When I looked at the topic and I said, man, Ruth told me to do this one, because I'm not a history buff. And, and I thought, man, I should have picked another Sabbath. But, you know, as, as I studied the lesson, it made me realize how important history was. The sacrifice that all of those characters in the Bible did made me realize and question, do I have that faith as they do? When they talked about Moses, what he did, Noah, you know, he never rained, and God told him to build an ark. You can imagine all the people that made fun of him, you know, ridiculed him, and all of a sudden he got in and still hadn't rained. That faith you know, made me realize how much, you know, I have to look at myself and say, you know what, do I really have that kind of faith in the end time? So that's why it's important because we need to know what God has planned for us and do we really have a close of a relationship with God that we can put everything on God and say, God, it's yours, you take it. You know, there was a saying that, you know, to, to go where you need to go, you need to first learn and see where you came from yeah. and i think that has a lot to do with how important history is for all of us uh which you know leads us to the other question is ruth you know most of the times when people talk about the bible or see the bible or read the bible or or anything they hear every time you hear the word notion bible uh, most of the time people think more of a religious context uh, as a as, as a uh, religious textbook of morals of ethics of 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 uh, right and wrong. Why do you think uh, God intended? And, and it, we know the Bible is not just that, but it, we know it also has a lot of history involved in it. A lot of narrative. The stories are we uh, you know as as Christians or Bible uh, study as we continue to do our Bible study, that, that uh, we know that the Bible is real. So why, why do you think, let's just say God intended, I think, that, that why God intended the, the Bible to also have a history lesson behind it? Um, going through our lesson this week, I, I realized that 
Well, the Bible is not like any other book. You know, God had a lot of, um, he had people from every, um, like every background. You know, there were people who were uh, like, like Daniel, you know, who would relate to prophecy. And he actually told how prophecy will finally lead to the end of times and how uh, time will be changed. Um, how we're going to be leading up and how he brought things from his own background and saw how God is going to lead us till the end of time. And I saw that uh, even to the lives of Moses, through life of Daniel, I mean, for um, Enoch, all those people, you know, their own lifestyles have helped us, uh, their backgrounds have helped us uh, in our own faith to build our, our faith more stronger. And the Bible helps us uh, if we uh, develop that personal relationship in uh, reading and um, dedicating our time to it, I think we will finally reach a destination by God's grace. Yeah. So, you know, our memory verse today uh, or, or for, uh, for, this, for this lesson, and it's found in Exodus 22, reading based on the New King James Version. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That context in itself tells me, I'm not sure if it tells you guys, but it tells me that God intended to report history, that he had a hand in history itself. Now, in, you have the, it's common knowledge nowadays that the Egyptians probably lied about a lot of their history, didn't mention a lot of things. And in and so I can't help thinking that God had felt like I need to let people know my story behind this because I cannot trust man to just write this story themselves. Um, but Joseph, you know, you know, we've heard of the stories of David, stories of Moses and Daniel, and and yet outside of the biblical test there is very scant knowledge or 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 um, hearings about these famous people especially like somebody like david great king of israel right so joseph how do you why, why do you think that there is such just scant maybe not so many uh non-biblical texts about these people that to question w whether the the historical events of the Bible really happened or not? Um, to begin with, let me say something here. Uh, there's a quote that I came across. It says, uh, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Hmm. And that kind of, you know, made me realize that, yes, th there are these people um, of faith that we learn from the Bible, but it so happens that within a very short time that the people forget. They forget what these people did, who, who they were, and probably their, their history was never recorded. And God, in his infinite wisdom, he put it in his word that people might be able to go back to the, to the Bible and read these stories. And when the scientists, when these archaeologists are excavating, they're actually proving that the Bible is true. It's a, it can be relied on. We can't use history to prove the Bible, but you can use the Bible to prove history. That's what I can say. I, I like how you worded that, that we can't use history to prove the Bible, but the Bible to prove history. Um, it's it's kind of like, you know, let's say you, you know, you're, you've, you've contributed a lot to the community, did a lot of good to the community, um, um, uh, providing Bible lessons, doing charity. Joseph did this, Joseph did that. But your name is just not going to be as popular as somebody like Tom Cruise, who maybe in history uh, records as one of the better actors. I mean, that's totally an opinion. But just saying that, or like Michael Jordan, one of the best basketball players in the, in, in, in the era of, of the NBA, uh, just stuff like that. Uh, and, and I think, you know, it, the, the Bible, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't pay attention to all that celebrity. It's, it's more of the, the story of humanity, 
the fall humanity, the salvation of man. Um, it doesn't matter who you are or what status you have. It's how God uses you to act in his story for the salvation of man in, in my regards. Moses, do you have anything to add to that? You know what I was thinking of what you were saying, and, and uh, you know, I agree with you totally. Because when you look at the Bible and you look at ourselves right now, you know, God gave us the opportunity because he knew what we were going to go through. And no matter what anybody went through, look at Adam and Eve, you know, what they did, they sinned, but he still forgave them. He still gave them an opportunity. If you look at all throughout history, look at the Israelites. You know, when Moses took them out, you know, they were complaining and whining. They, didn't, they got, you know, tired of the manna and, you know, and all of these things. So it allows us to know that no matter what we're going through in life, God will always be there and will get you through it. We just have to believe. And, and that goes back to faith. And, and Ruth, how does faith, your faith, or how does history affect your faith? Um, the simple character of, um, many by actually I simply believe in life of Joseph, you know, or um, uh, somebody like Rahab, their lifestyles were very simple, and God doesn't call, want his like, famous people out to be out there to serve him. He qualifies the one who accepts his call. And um, especially in the life of Joseph, he was called a dreamer. You know, his, his brothers made fun of him. But who would have ever dreamt that he would be somebody great in God's vineyard one day, not only to save his own family, but he saved the whole world. And it just through. Um, you know, going to history, um, it, I'm just thinking, even going back to David, who would have dreamed that small shepherd boy would have been the lineage of Dave, um, leading up to Christ, mm -hmm. where he was going to be born from that lineage. Um, so the very fact that, you know, God chooses humble people and that trust that they have, the faith that they uh, experience, has come back to my own life when I've seen it in my own life. Uh, I've experienced it a lot. And I'm sure all of us have in our own experiences. And that makes you feel more trustable, uh, trust God more, especially when I was, you know, as a child, we grow up to depend on our parents a lot. And um, we think our parents, anything and everything, we run up to our parents. But then in the end, uh, when you go through your own experiences in life, and I, I relate myself to a time when I went to nursing school where, um, uh, where I, didn't listen to my parents. I would skip meals and finally get into a time where I had to drop my uh, hemoglobin down to about four. I could have easily lost my life at that time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, through it, and I, I, it has gone through a lot of faith that I've come up to this for right now to say that I believe and I know the history that God has led us through will carry us to the end. Yeah, I, you know, I have a. Um... We have some friends and some uh, somebody's have had the opportunity to just have uh, sit downs and lunches with them at, at the church. Um, and and w one of them would say without saying any names, obviously, but one of them asked, like, how could you believe that, for example, Jonah was in the belly of a big fish before and to travel up to to be taken up to Nineveh and be spitting out there. It's just the story seems so outlandish. You think that that one was just written by man to make it more a, a provocative story to, to, pro, to provoke more thought, to attract more people to read some story it may have been simple as him just riding up a canoe. And this is where faith comes in, I think. Um, that to, to know and trust that you, it's obvious that God's hand had to be in history for him to guide the, the writers to write this history. Because if it weren't for that, imagine if we didn't have anybody, if, if there was no, nobody as, as name as David or Joseph um, or, or Joshua or, or, or even, uh, it, you know, just, they would have not existed had it not been for the hand of God to guide history to where we are now today. That's, that's 
a, a, that's just mind blowing to me just going through this. And Joseph, why is faith in God always an essential part of our journey toward the kingdom of heaven? You know, when I was going through this lesson, I, I came across something that somebody said, that if we take Jesus out of the context of everything, then we, we are not left standing on anything. So the center of history, the center of the Bible, the center of the world, the center of our faith. In fact, the book of Hebrews says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Yeah, it, it is just that serious. We, we just have to have faith and believe in the things that we cannot see, things that are hoped for, things that our forefathers talked about. We just have faith in it. And our faith becomes so strong such that we, we are not even basing our faith on another human being. Just the fact that another human being failed and you know they did not live according to the standards of Christianity or anything like that, you know, it should not make us you know, lose faith because we have our faith in Jesus and for, because of the things that he has said and the things that we can see around us and we prove that, uh, to testify that he really is our God. Right. And, you know, in Hebrews, uh, in chapter 11, it does say that um, you cannot approach God without having faith. Um, and that's the true essential of this whole story. It's, it's knowing that putting your trust in God and knowing that your origins and the reason of your existence and your purpose now, what he has created you to do and your salvation was based off of this whole history of the whole planet since the time of creation, um, even up to this day. If you understand that, then you understand now why the world is in a, in a precarious position, position as it is now today. Our, you know, our people, our, our, our focus, our purpose now has not changed since the time when God created uh, back in Genesis 1.1. Uh, hey, Rio? Yes. I was thinking when we were talking, uh, you know, also God, when we're talking about history, God also gave us an, a way that we can identify. Uh, when I was thinking of the story of David and Goliath, mm. I was thinking, how many of us on a daily basis face a giant? No matter what you analogy you want to put in or what we're facing, and sometimes we feel like we're not worthy of it or that we are not going to be able to overcome it. But look at David. He was a young young man. They put on his armor, and he didn't couldn't walk. So he took it off, and he just had five stones, and he had a slingshot. And you know, Goliath looked at him and said, "I'm going to tear you up, and I'm going to feed you to the birds." But he had so much faith in God that he overcame it. And so can we on a daily basis when we get those big storms, those big giants. If we just put everything in God, we can overcome anything. And I think that's why God gave us the history, that we, well, no matter what we're going to go through in life, there's always something there to remind us that God loves us and that he'll get us through. Which begs the, uh, the, the answer to the question, which I was actually going to ask you, how does, how does history affect your life? In, 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 <laughs> which is great. You know, you're not, you know, that's great. It's, uh, it's, 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 the Holy Spirit is moving through us right now. I feel it's great on this uh, Sabbath day. Um, you know, the... The you have, for example, the prophecies of Daniel, and uh, in in Daniel, not of Daniel, in Daniel, and how it how that has shown that that God has a again a hand in in history, um, how He controls the the flow of countries, the, the establishment of kingdoms or the fall of kingdoms. Um, you know, in, in Daniel, in going back to how history uh, affects your life, um, you know, Joseph, when Daniel said he, he purposed his heart, he purposed in his heart in Daniel 1.8, what, what, does, what does that mean to you? It means right from the start, right from the time that Daniel and his friends and the other Hebrews were taken captive into Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel had already determined that he was not going to partake of the evils 
of that kingdom that they, were, they had been taken to. And soon enough, they are, they are brought into tests about food, the things that they are going to eat to feed their bodies, probably the things that they are going to watch. And Daniel was already determined that he was not going to participate in those things that are going to, to, be, to bring dishonor to the word of God or to, to dishonor God. And based on that, because right from the start, God, Daniel made a decision to, to stay firmly on God. But then God gave him wisdom so, and strong faith so that when the tests came later in life, he just faced them without any problem. So is the case with the, with the other Hebrew, Hebrews, uh, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had already made this plan, and when they were told they were going to be thrown into the fire, they said, oh, king, live forever, but we are not going to worship you. We've already made up our minds. We are not going to worship, we are not going to, to worship this image. So Daniel made purpose in his heart. He decided, come what? Come rain, come shine. He was going to serve God. And in, to add another question to that, Joseph, yes. the, you, know, you see um, Daniel purposing his heart in a, in a time where he is different. His friends are different from an, a, a, new, a, a new established kingdom that uh, will rule for a long time, but it's different in culture and tradition in religion. How different is that compared to today? Or is it different? Well, I don't think it is different because probably Daniel would have said, well, we've been taken from our people that already, the people that know us, our church leaders, here we are in a foreign land and we can live just the way we want. Nobody's going to, to, to see, you know, the things that you're going to do. And that's what many people, many, many of the Hebrews fell into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, they probably thought nobody's watching them. But Daniel knew that God was there, present, whether in prison, whether in bondage, or whether he was a free man. It just confirms more that God's hand was in throughout history. Yes, we all have a free, uh, a choice, a free will, but nobody... You know, if you look at the history books, any history book, American history, world history, even stuff from Barnes and Noble, and I love gra grabbing history books in Barnes and Noble. Sometimes when it's like two ninety nine, it's I just buy it off the shelf. But I challenge anybody to look at those non biblical textbooks of history and see where the author has ever indicated that God's hand was working through that. You you know, we have a lot of non-biblical text that met that that corroborates what the bible has said you know with king hezekiah and the sennacherib um uh, uh steli um you have the historians of the of rome you know being more of a non-biased just a recorder instead of uh, uh you know seeing you know, either that there were such things as christians back then um the traditions or whatnot and or what uh, that that the Sennacherib Telly confirming that what God had said about Jerusalem not falling, but you know being seized for one day, not even lasting a day, not one arrow being shot, and that He will protect His people in Jerusalem. That was all confirmed on that. He said He was besieged, but He said Jerusalem was besieged but never taken. Uh, those, but never have we found. I would think a historical textbook that's not of biblical form saying that God's hand was in this, what had it happened? Um, you know, going back to Daniel just a little bit, Ruth, um, is, is history kind of like uh, a fulfillment of prophecy? Yes. Yes. Um, it I think uh, I don't really want to go into the recent prophecy seminar that we had. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Everything that we talked about there, I'm just thinking, you know, um, if uh, we can see that uh, times are fulfilling. And uh, all I can say is we still, I'm not, uh, I really am not a fan of prophecies. But ever since all this COVID started happening, I think I started listening to more. I work with um, Joseph and he always 
um, you know, he's, I think he's a very good, like a moral support for me. <laughs> he's encouraging me with many things, many sermons that he listens to. And of late, I've been listening to a lot of um, officer seminars, and I think, which I never really um, was interested before. I would yeah. try to listen to a, oh, somebody with a testimony, not more than that. Or, um, well, I, I, I think I know where you're coming from, because sometimes when the word prophecy is said, there's like maybe a doom time end to it, and it brings anxiety to a lot of people, especially yes. now where there's a lot of anxiety in the world. It, it's just, not even just in the world, just here in the, in the U.S. Um, you, you with COVID, or even the world with COVID, and also the riots going on. Um, but it also confirms that, and again, we've been saying this all along, that history, his story, his, God's hand, all it says, even with the prophecy in the end times, all it says, to, or tells me is that, don't worry. There's a bigger and more and stronger and more powerful being in God that's guiding through all this. And in the end, that re relaxes me in a way that I know um, it, when the end times do come, that there is light at the end of that tunnel, that, that, that God is behind from the beginning and from the end, from the front and the back, it's, it's always have been God. And that's just so uh, just fantastic about this whole uh, study with the Bible and, and, and its history. Uh, let's let's kind of move on to Jesus' history. Jesus, right? Celebrity of Christianity. Can anybody doubt that? Uh, Lord of Lords, he is our Savior. But not a whole lot of reports or written documents about him outside of the church. <laughs> And I think that's why it's important to have the Gospels, it's, it's, you know, with, with especially with Luke's very accurate description of, of that. And, and I'm not saying the other ones weren't, but um, I'm always intrigued with Luke's description of Christ's life. Um, Moses, why do you think there's such a discrepancy in, in Jesus as this savior of man in this great book of ours, the Bible, versus, let's say, Flavius Josephus saying there's this, this pretty good guy who lived and kind of caused some riots. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. And I uh, was uh, thinking about it while you were talking. Uh, and I think it's just even from the beginning. I think everybody has this perception when the Savior came. And he came not like they wanted him to come but he came the way he won and, you know, he was humble. Uh, you know, the people at that time, the Jewish people wanted him to come and conquer the Romans and, and do it their way. And God came his way and he showed to turn the other cheek, to be humble, to love one another. And I think the world wasn't ready for that. And I think it's the same thing now. I think when you accept, and we, you know, we we're just talking about it before we came in is that when you become a Christian, there's a transformation between the previous to when you're walking with God. And I don't think people understand that transformation. I don't think we preach about it enough that there has to be this change. And so people kind of look at God and, and put him in a box the way they want to perceive him. And, and I think that's why we don't have what we have. But if people just looked at Christ and lived by his principles, we would live in a better world. You know, um, Ruth, how do... Um... You know, I was talking earlier about how, for example, Joseph um, could be a, a nurse of the year at UMC or, or be a contributor to the community or, um, uh, or just be a, a charity, charitable to El Paso and very commended for those and be well known, but yet you won't just, will not exceed that popularity of like a Michael Jordan or a LeBron James or or, or movie celebrities or whatnot. How do you present Jesus, a Christ, as, as, as that celebrity to a non-believer? Uh, 
I think many times we have to go to their level. Uh, we're not going to, we need to put ourselves, um, not that we need to adopt whatever they do, but we need to like, probably, you know, you might want to invite, you, know, if, or you might want to spend some time just like, like if you had know somebody at your workplace, I don't know about celebrity right now, but somebody you think that you, um, who is not easy to get along with, but then um, going out with this person to help and, and his, assist him in helping out him, helping him out with his work. Like sometimes if he's having a crazy day or she's having a crazy day, try to help out with either saying, hey, I'll pass out your medications or I'll, I'll help you with another procedure. You go on with your, uh, this patient, I'll help you with another patient. Mm -hmm. Help, you know, and then that person probably, you know, would have been very rough with you at, at times. And they would have wondered why would why is she trying to help me, or why is this person trying to go out of their way to help me? I didn't do it really. First of all, I don't even like this person. Why are they coming to help me? And I, I'm think, and I'm sure that person will something will um, bring up in his mind that he is going to accept you somewhere or the other. And I think that's one way of approaching people, like putting your um, humbling yourself to help somebody else. Um, yeah. Will have to. You know, you, you wonder if, uh, let's say, if Christ was born in an age when there's social media and there's, there's cameras and there's satellites and there's in internet, and, and, but he came from humble beginnings. It was, there was no pronouncement in a way. Yeah, there was pronouncement in the heavenly realm, but not so much in the earthly or worldly realms. Uh, came from humble beginnings, born in a manger, um, simple parents, not of royalty in a, in a sense, in a worldly sense. Uh, so, you know, that could possibly explain why not so much is written about it, like not even a blurb or a headline in the, in the newspaper saying like, here, there's this Christ Messiah that came, come over to the manger, everybody. Um, but like we know how we study the Bible, that this is the one biggest gift that God has ever given man in, in Jesus Christ. Um, Joseph, and to close out a bit, though, you know, it's, it's, we have all these, you know, I did say that there's some scant reports about Christ, but there's a lot of other archaeological texts that supports, that mentions characters surrounding Christ, like Pontius Pilate, uh, Caiaphas, you know, just more people with a little bit more status in a, in a worldly sense that had to be recorded. You know, versus somebody who was born from a carpenter. Um, you know, it's nice to have these archaeological evidence that supports our faith. But Joseph, why must we learn not to make our faith dependent upon these things? On on the, dependent on the archaeological test. We, why must we not rely or just put place our faith on that? Well, I think the the whole idea of Jesus coming. And probably why not so much of him is written in the historical books is because I, I think there's an element of the devil doesn't want, he wants right from the start, wanted to destroy Jesus. And Jesus, of course, he did not come to glorify himself. He came to reveal to us the Father. And we can only know that by reading about the people like Paul. Paul, who was anti, I would say he was anti-Christ. He was anti-Semitic. He, he met Jesus and Jesus transformed him. And, and I think that's what Jesus wanted to do. He wanted to impart this power to people so that they can amplify him rather than Jesus himself amplifying himself. Look at the case where Jesus, uh, Peter is, is in the house of Cornelius and he says in, in, in Acts chapter 10 verse 39, he says, we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's very profound. You know, we have people like that, you know, that followed Jesus closely and they were able to tell other people, probably in a, in a, in a, in a deeper way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, mean, I misspoke earlier. Paul is not anti-Semitic. He's anti-Christian, like you said. And, and I, I agree with you in that. Um, you know, 
closing out and thank you guys for such a great participation and uh, i was worried i was going to run out of questions but you guys did <laughs> awesome and all this stuff um just closing out we you know the bible we all believe in by faith that it is the most comprehensive historical book that we ever could possess and I know ellen white even said that in god's word only we behold the power that laid the foundations of the earth and that stretched out the heavens. Here only do we find an authentic account of the origin of nations. Here only is given a history of our race, unsullied, okay, unsullied by human pride or pre prejudice. Nobody lied about it. Nobody was biased about it. It is unsullied by human pride or prejudice. And I think that's part of real also the reason to really study into the scriptures on a daily basis it is that's so important not just in regard to religious uh, moral or ethic um, uh, experience but also because I don't know how many times people have come up to me and or asked I'm gonna quit my job I'm gonna go to Asia or Europe to go find myself find my purpose the purpose is all here in the scriptures it's been there since the beginning, since God uh, created man, since even before then, since before the fall of the angels. Um, it's, it's always been his story. And we also agree that he's always been in, behind this whole thing. And, and I thank you guys again for being here. Anybody have any final thoughts before we close? Why not? Um, uh, and, and I thank you guys again for uh, participating. And for our audience, um, I pray that you continue to study the word and, and uh, hopefully have a little bit more appreciation of history for those who don't. And um, we love you all and have, have a happy Sabbath. And uh, Joseph, would you mind closing for us, please? Let us bow our heads for prayer. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time that you have given us to study the word, especially looking at the historical events and how they affect our salvation. We thank you, Jesus, because you have given us this wisdom and the knowledge to know more about you. And as we prepare in this world, in this troubled world, may you prepare our hearts to meet you when you come again, when our faith will be made sight. We are looking forward to that day. Bless us, bless each one of us, bless those who are watching this program, and may you keep us all in, in faith and trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Welcome, El Paso Church family. Today is June 6, 2020. And it's a beautiful day, a beautiful Sabbath. And we're so glad that we can be with you from Albuquerque. We have a special board meeting on Sunday, June 7, that's tomorrow, at 1 p.m. on Zoom. Prosper the Wanted will be sending out the Zoom link, so we would like you all to attend. There will be a regular board meeting on Sabbath, June 13, at 8.10, and it's also on June. That's next Sabbath. During this pandemic, we still have the Adventist Book Centers direct to you service will be making their regular stop at El Paso Central on June 23. If you want to order books, food, or materials from them, make sure to either call in your order at 800-333-1844 or email it to food.abc at txsda.org by June 18. To see their selection, visit their website at abckeen.com. Check out childmen.org for some great ideas. Don't forget social distancing. You need to be six feet apart and don't forget your mask. Have a blessed Sabbath service.
morning. Happy Sabbath. We are going to lift our voices to praise the Lord this morning. We are going to sing hymn number 198 and can it be? Blessed Sabbath to each of you. Thank you for inviting me to worship with you. Let us pray. Eternally loving God of the infinite universe, we come before you to worship you, to praise you for your everlasting love, to praise you for your perfect wisdom, to praise you for your infinite power. We come not in our own worthiness, our own goodness, but we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. We come because you call us to lay at your feet those burdens that the evil one puts on our lives. We lay at your feet our pride. We lay at your feet our rebellion. We lay at your feet our loneliness our sorrow, our worries, our concerns for loved ones near, loved ones far. We lay at your feet the sicknesses that trouble our bodies. We lay at your feet the sicknesses in our families, in our church families, 
in our communities, in this entire world. And we come before you, praising you, that you have made a perfect plan to restore all things to your beauty. We praise you that in your great strength and power, you surely will bring this perfect plan to its perfect completion. And we come before you with joy, looking forward to that great day. Amen. Hey, what's up? Like my new glasses? They block the sun and the harmful UV rays. They also help me see better outside and they're fun to wear. The way they block the sun, protecting us from the UV rays, reminds me of other ways to protect our eyes. Do any of your parents not let you watch specific shows, block you from certain things on the internet? The reason they do this is to protect you from things that can harm your mind. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Doesn't that sound great? I mean, who wouldn't want to think about those things? But the world often turns away from all the things that are pure. The reason why Paul, the guy who wrote Philippians, asks us to think about things that are lovely, good, and pure is because if we think that way, then we would become that way. If you want to be excellent and praiseworthy, you have to avoid things that will harm your heart and mind. You could do this by protecting your eyes from things you shouldn't see. So use wisdom, kind of like you would use these glasses to protect your eyes. If you're not sure about a movie or a book you want to read, think about Philippians 4. Ask if it's lovely, right, or admirable. Just like you wouldn't go outside on a sunny day without sunglasses, don't go outside without wisdom to protect your mind and heart. And this is the end of the story. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Um, it's good. Uh, well, I wish I was with you guys at church, but, you know, I, I know that I'm kind of with you, but I, I do know I have someone in my congregation right now. Uh, her name is Jubilee. Say hi, everyone. Say hi to Jubilee. Jubilee, say hi. Hi. Um, she'll be walking around looking for a place to sleep as this is being recorded. Go ahead, Jubilee. See you later, buddy. At least I have someone listening, right? Uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, like I said, it's always weird preaching to yourself, but... You know, it, I'm getting used to it slowly, but I can't wait to see you guys again and just uh, just be fellowship with you guys in church, whenever that might be. But I'm excited for it. I'm really excited for it. Um, this uh, this these last two weeks are just this last week in general. No, two weeks has been it's been like a week, two weeks. I've been really uh, really saddening and and just seeing the the turmoil and and, and the pain within so many of our brothers and sisters. Um, over the death of George Floyd and the African American community and all those communities that have ever felt, um, you know, racism or just injustice or discrimination. Sad to see um, a man die and, you know, be suffocated to death and, 
uh, for eight minutes, you know, and I, and honestly, whether whether or not he had these underlying health issues or anything of that nature, it doesn't matter. No man should be treated less than a, a human being as such. And so I, I, I uh, for those of you who might be hurting, I hurt with you. And, um, and, and I stand with you as we stand against such hatred and, and injustice. I stand with you. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as I've been thinking more and more about, about just, just the, the turmoil and the chaos within our world, you know, God brought to my mind, you know, a topic of restoration. And it's interesting how you could see it through the, through the biblical narrative, how, how we have a God who's going to bring all things back into place. And, and to be honest, I want to share with you this narrative, um, if you don't mind. It touched my heart, and I wanted to share with each and every one of you, if you guys would. Uh, but before I do, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I have this, you know, this sense, you know, if there's something, there's some issue between you or a brother or a sister or just a colleague or anybody, you know, pause the sermon. The sermon, can, you can always come back to it. Pause it right now. Go deal with it because that's what's really important on Saturday, not to watch a sermon. As though, you know, it has its significance, but honestly, what's even more important is that we're at peace with one another. We're at peace with each other. You know, we can have disagreements. We can have arguments, but we need to find resolution. And so if that is you, you know, pause the sermon right now. If there's a problem with your family, you know, don't don't force people to watch the sermon, but just take time, pause and say, how can we fix this? How can we come to resolution? And, and find peace within our home. That way, when you guys do come together and you watch and you watch whatever sermon you may be watching, mine or someone else's later on, that everyone can have a mindset of just of of, of peace and, and 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 this overwhelming sense of calmness. You know, that's what's really important at this time. And especially with all the noise that we've been hearing over social media, over the news, everything. Oh man, we need peace, and uh, and God can only give us peace. And and so I encourage you. Jubilee, as my member watching, go find peace. Go sleep, man. You need, you need sleep. Let's uh, let's pray to start as we talk about this concept and this this amazing story of how God is bringing everything into restoration. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to just speak to your children. Father, they are all your children, every single one of them. And Father, every single one of them have come from a different background, culture, you know, ethnicity, just so many different things, Father. But I know that we can all find unity within you, Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you hush our minds and our hearts. And, Father, let the words that are spoken from your word and from the narrative of the Bible speak to us. And, Father, let it bring wisdom and understanding. And, Father, empathy. And, Father, most importantly, love. May that just overflow in our hearts and our minds. So, Father, when we speak out of the abundance of the heart, Father, it would just be love. This is my prayer. And this is... I plea that you would just increase so I decrease. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So like I said before, you know, I want to take you on this biblical narrative. Um, uh, and and it's it's it starts off in Genesis. And I'm sure many of you know this sort of creation. And if you don't, I have it here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the face of the earth. And the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. You have a world that was there, it was without form or void, but you have a God who wanted just to create. Because, you know, within the Trinity, if you think about it, you know, it's it's interesting that if you see within the Trinity, it is a relational, um, uh, uh, not covenant, but they are relational being, beings. You know, it's it's they have been together. It's not this it's not this God that is selfish that is just he's been up there all by himself. But we have to understand that it was God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always together, and they desired to share that type of relational covenant, that 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 relational just love with others. And so then they began to create, and it's this beautiful, beautiful story of how God he just forms and then he fills. You see, God never created anything out of nothing. You see that in light and darkness. You see, there was darkness everywhere. So God took light out of himself and put it into existence. Beautiful. And when he creates light and darkness, he fills it with the sun, moon, and stars. When he creates the sea and sky, he fills it with fish and birds. And so it's forming and this filling. And, and, it's, and it's all, all so amazing. But honestly, the, the, just the climax of creation. 
that if one to read it as if as if from Egypt or you know Moses the Egyptians or the Israelites, if one to create this account of creation, even even as the angels were watching this, it came to this moment that changed everything. For God spoke things into existence. All of a sudden, He stops, and He begins to form with His very hands, man. And what I love about the story of man, you know, first of all, we're created out of the dust of the ground. And that already tells us that we are not God. We have a beginning and, and, and we, are, we are formed from the dust. Therefore, we have limitations. But what's even more powerful is that God in the midst of just this dust he makes it so unique, so special because he breathes into us the breath of life. He takes a piece of himself and puts it into man. Beautiful. And, and I love this because this begins to talk about man's identity. And man's identity, God makes Adam into his own image. And when we bear the image of God, we also get to partake in, 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 some, in, 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 in what he does as well. We get to rule with God because God loves to delegate power. We see this in Job, the sons of man, you know, the sons of God come and, and they surround God's throne. And it's God always delegating power. God creates, but then God says, hey, come here. I want you to take care of this. I want you to rule this with me. It's, it's not Adam. He's the sole God of the earth. But God's saying, you rule this with me. I love to share my power with you because within God is selflessness. We'll see that more as we continue on. Oh, Lord, I think... Nope, I don't have blindness. I thought I did. And 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 I, what I love is that God then says, subdue the earth and all that is within it. And when I think about subduing, you know, I think I have honestly a negative connotation to it. Because, you know, when I think of subduing, I think of someone controlling or someone taking over someone through violence or you know in basketball you know how how some guy dunks on somebody oh you know man up you know weight room something like that you know that's that's kind of what i think about subduing and and when i when i hear of like adam subdue the earth i also think like just because of my experience and what i've i've known you know adam putting his his foot over a giraffe's neck and say boy you mine you know so you know it, it's just always in a in not a good way you know but when God created the earth, everything was good. And, and as I said before, man was made in the image of God. Therefore, they were supposed to rule the world according to their God-given identity. And when I try to think of a word or, or try to characterize God, I think 1 John 4 really does it well. Because last time I checked your Bible, God is what? He's love. Therefore, when I think of Adam subduing the earth, there's not an issue with that premise of love. Because love is so beautiful. It's so other-centeredness. It's, it's, it's selflessness, humility, humble, peaceful, patient, it's kind. It's faithful, it's gentle, it's courageous, and it's strong. So therefore, when Adam is ruling the earth, the plants, the animals, even his own wife has nothing to fear. Nor does, it, nor does he have anything to fear his wife. Because love is at the center of their hearts. And love is the way they would choose to subdue the earth as governors, as, as managers, if you might say it. As leaders, as co-heirs. Therefore, when they go into the, the forest, the trees, the plants... They have nothing to fear because they understand that Adam, their leader, their manager, will take care of them appropriately. Because in his mind and in his heart, what reigns is selflessness, humility. He cares. In order to be the greatest, you must be the least of these. This is, this is how Adam chose to rule the world. And this is the beautiful cycle of how Adam and Eve, they cared for one another. They cared for others. They cared for the environment. They loved God. And it was this beautiful, beautiful story of creation and, and how God first instituted this type of government. And that's the next point I want to make out to you. This was the first government that was established. The very first one. 
this was not only the story of creation, but this was a story of how God instituted a government based and built on the foundation of love, which is the character and identity of God. And, and what's even more powerful about love, that we should never think of this in a bad way, but this is just an amazing thing in how we too should also govern our families and everybody. But love can never ever force, nor can it coerce. It cannot force you. It cannot try to pump, like beat you down for you to just submit to its will. But love always and forever will give freedom of choice. It will, period, case closed. But the thing about freedom of choice is it comes with a risk that the being that you created, that the person you allowed to, to partake and to rule your world might actually one day turn against you. But before we get into that concept, you know, I just love what Ty Gibson says in this book called Sonship of Christ. He says, they were to govern the, from a relational premise of other centeredness, procreating the image of God from generation to generation, thus perpetrating a benevolent lordship of the world. Thus, Adam and Eve initially, in the beginning, this is how our world was supposed to be. They were supposed to rule the world. Uh, through this premise of love, other centeredness, and then on continuously, God says, go and, and multiply, procreate, continue to establish love, and, and also procreate that in other beings and other people that will bear my image, that will bear my identity, which is the foundation, which its foundation is found in love. Thus, as the world was supposed to continue, and as Adam and Eve were supposed to multiply, and their generations multiply, and, and so on and so forth, the only thing, the, the, the government that was established was to continue to proclaim, to teach, to, to uphold this premise of love. Thus, there was nothing to fear. And honestly, as I, I look back at my testimony, as I shared with you guys earlier, this is the thing that caught my eye. This is the thing that I just fathered that. There will be no weeping, you know, no hurt or pain, no suffering. This is the government I really want to be a part of. I want to be a part of. That I wish would have last forever, but sadly, Adam lost his right to rule, to be the ruler of the world and gave it to a new ruler. And that's where the story just, chapter three, just downhill from there. Because the other ruler did not rule from a from a uh, from a premise or from a foundation of love, but actually from the opposite. And you see, when Adam sinned against God and Eve sinned against God, it was. It, I love how Ty Gibson he puts this in such a beautiful way, and I love how he writes. He says it was much more than a a if it, it was the fall of mankind was therefore more than a moral fall. It was also a governmental fall, a governmental shift. A new ruler was, was over the throne. Therefore, new principles were being taught. New principles were being proclaimed throughout the country, throughout the world. And what is the opposite of love, if not self? And that is what truly began to reign in the hearts of Adam and Eve. And we see that immediately, Adam, where are you? I was afraid, Lord, so I hid. Where did fear come from? Perfect love casts out all fear. So what in the world? And I know it says fear God is the beginning of wisdom, but you have to understand the context of what it means to fear God, to, to uphold, to just see his beauty and to see his awesomeness and, and to surrender to his and, and to surrender to his glory. But this type of fear that Adam and Eve were fearing, it, it, was, it was nothing they've ever felt before. Trembling before God, being just, just hiding from his presence because you were scared of his holiness rather than just being in awe, rather than being scared. Where did that come from? Or, or how Adam immediately trying to save his skin. It was the woman. I mean, how many of us have said that before? It was the woman, you know, trying to save our own skin. Or right after they get kicked out of the Garden of Eden, you know, what happens to Cain? What happens to Abel? 
death? Where did this come from? Where did this hatred, this anger to kill your brother out of jealousy? Where is this coming from? Or you go even beyond that to towards a 10 and 11 where you have the flood because mankind, they ruled and they and they continue to, 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 to hold up to this foundation so much that sin and destruction was just so overwhelming that it was about to bring the humanity to the brink of destruction. So God had to literally stop, start over with the flood. Self. Because Satan, he instead of he does not rule with selflessness, he rules with selfishness. And and he does not instead he does not give freedom, he rules with bondage. And we see this. But you have to see the contrast here. See, Ty Gibson put this again wonderfully. The grand objective of creation, as we've seen, is that humanity would exercise dominion over their own realm of existence and voluntary, love that word, voluntary harmony with God's character. That's how these things were supposed to go. That's how our world was supposed to be. That's how it was supposed to be from generation to generation and to end, never end, ceaseless lifetimes, just forever and ever. But, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. And that is the world we live in today. And it seemed at the time of Adam and Eve, I mean, honestly, it kind of looks like our world today. When I look at social media, I honestly think there is no hope. I, I see so many different things and I understand why there is pain. And I understand why why there is even pain amongst this group as they're trying to do uphold a, a principle. But people are acting just out of, out of hand and, and using this as an excuse. But there is honestly pain and we can't categorize these two people together. The protests and the looters. We, but regardless, that's that's just a different. I I just want to keep going with this concept because I could get stuck in this. But there's so much pain, there's so much chaos, there's so much division. There's no more unity, there's no more peace. But there's just chaos. So we are surrounded by it. So much noise, hurt, suffering. I just I can't even fathom. When I looked at the video, when I look at so many different other things, I see. I see death, I see sin, I see destruction. I see a government built on self. And honestly, it looks like there's no hope when I look at the world around me. You know, I, you know, and, and as we are citizens of El Paso, you know, this isn't just the first time we felt this way. El Paso strong, a man filled with so much hate as well to another demographic that he begins to shoot people just just without even without any warning without anything he just begins to kill how many people did he kill at the parking lot of walmart guys this isn't something new i know this is something media is pushing right now and i understand why but honestly this is this has happened so many different times to so many different demographics and so many of their ethnicities this is sickening this is this is just total truly what the world we live in but god and that's, that's where the story gets good in creation. God knew they sinned. God knew now that this would ultimately be their, their destiny. But God said, no, I'm not going to let you go. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to sing. I'm not a singer. But God said, no. And then you have God stepping into the garden of me, knowing that it's, it's, there's something wrong. And he knows exactly what's wrong. But then he cries out. Where are you? Ah, beautiful. The gospel right there. God leaving the night. And not only does he seek, but he gives hope. Notice this with me. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. In other words, that at Satan, you will not have complete dominion over them. That yes, there will be opportunities where these things can arise. Yes, Satan, you will have control to a certain extent where you can actually produce such hatred in people's hearts for this to arise and so many different other things that we've seen. Yes, yes, yes. But I will put enmity. I will give my people, if they choose to, to my people, if they choose to, to deny to deny this citizenship of this world that will end in destruction they can deny it and they can choose me through a seed that I will produce through a woman who is the
the Son of God and the Son of Man, choosing to become both, to unite us together once again. Oh, beautiful. And he shall crush your head and you shall bruise your heel. Yeah, you'll cause suffering to my to the son that is coming in. But let me tell you something. His, you're ended. That this, this world we live in, it will come to an end. I will put an end to all this noise, to this chaos, to destruction through this seed. In other words, I will give my people hope. And brothers and sisters, that's during this time of, of endless violence. That's what we need to hold on to. Hope in Jesus Christ. And not in this kingdom. God have mercy. May we stop spreading. Be more, be more to the right. Be more to the left. May we stop spreading that, please. May we start spreading. Be a part of God's kingdom. That's what we need to spread. I, man, there, may people know it's not by our political affiliation, but by the love that reigns in our hearts. That is what we need to spread. Whether, whether or not this person will be uh, elected or this person be elected in the next few months, to be honest, what does it matter when you have the king of kings reigning over all of us? That is what we need to be the primary focus. I'm not saying these things are insignificant. They're important. But our primary focus needs to be on the hope of the second coming. Or have you forgotten lately about Daniel chapter 2? I just did a Bible study today. It was wonderful. Today's Thursday for me, but I know it's Saturday morning, whatever time you're watching. But we studied Daniel chapter 2. And honestly, it was so beautiful to see this, this man see just, whoa, I'm living in the last age. Because if, if maybe you haven't studied Daniel chapter 2, but there's a vision that Nebuchadnezzar receives about a statue made of head of gold, a body of silver, waist of bronze, legs of iron, and feet mixed with iron, mixed with clay, trying to adhere or trying to stick to one another. And what Daniel interprets is that each of these uh, these these body parts of the of the statue or these these pieces of metal actually represent a different kingdom that we can prove through history. So in other words, God predicted 2,500 years into the future with Daniel. It's amazing to see how Bible, the Bible is true and the Bible is truly inspired. It's not just a book of facts. It's a love letter of God saying, listen, I know you've decided to allow another kingdom to rise. But if you so desire again, I will restore. Because notice with me in the interpretation of Daniel, it says that this kingdom will rise, but it will fall to another. And then this kingdom, which was Gre Medo-Persia, would rise to another and fall. And Greece would fall to Rome and Rome would fall to the Holy Roman Empire. Or in other words, Europe split into 10 nations. And, and what's kind of funny is, what part of the statue do we belong to? Are we in the time of Rome? No. We're in the time of iron mixed with clay. Or have you noticed that there's America, there's China, Japan, there's Russia. There's all these governments trying to adhere to one another, but they're not able to. Therefore, according to the prophecy said in Daniel chapter 2, the next kingdom that will rise is a big old rock. And it's going to come crashing down at the, foot, at the feet of this statue. Grind it down to just simply powder and that rock will then grow uh, into the entire world and it will be established forever and you know what that rock is that is the second coming of jesus christ that is establishing the kingdom of god and brothers and sisters we are living at the toenails of this last kingdom therefore what shall we be preaching more than anything other in the world the kingdom of God. And notice how the kingdom of God is established. There are various things that, 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 that Daniel is showing in contrast, but one of the primary things that Daniel is really trying to contrast is how the kingdoms of this world have been established versus the kingdom of God and how it will be established. Notice with me that in order for Medo Persia to triumph over, over Babylon, right, it became great. And in order for Medo -Per in order for Greece to triumph over Medo Persia, it waxed very great. And in order for Rome to triumph over Greece, it waxed exceedingly great. In other words, each of these kingdoms, in order to control another, or in order to to dominate or in order to subdue it had to do with even more violence even more war even more with a like power and all these different things but what's so interesting is that the kingdom of god that he wants to establish that he actually established during the time of rome so beautiful notice with me 
He is called the Prince of what? Peace? Not a Prince of War? Of violence? A Prince of what? Peace? Notice what uh, Ty Gibson says in this book. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, as well as every other kingdom of the world operates on the premise of what? Power. Employing violence for the spread of the rule. The Son of Man, check this out, Jesus achieves his rule by means of self-sacrificing love. Interesting, isn't that the same, isn't that the same government that was established in Eden? Is the same one he established again? So you're telling me God has restored restoration, baby. He has restored that which was lost. And, and I love how he says this in Mark chapter 1. The time is fulfilled and then king and the kingdom, sorry, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. God's kingdom has been established. The central church and whoever's watching is. God's kingdom has been established and God's kingdom rules on the premise of love. Simply love. Love does not force, love does not coerce, love it does not seek its own, but love is other centeredness. Love is all about how can I serve you today? What kingdom are you a part of? What kingdom are you proclaiming? And through your actions, through your comments on Facebook, what kingdom are you a part of? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what is your mouth speaking? What's in your heart? What, what, what is it, guys? When people see you, how will they know you are God's disciples by the way you what? Treat one another. How are you treating one another despite your disagreements? How, brothers and sisters? How? Is it through the premise of love or is it through something else? The Bible says something so profound that not only does God establish the kingdom of God once again, but you know what's so crazy? He does the same thing he did in Garden of Eden. He says, come be my co-heirs. Come rule the kingdom with me and go and make disciples of all nations. All that I've commanded you. What are you making disciples of? I mean, when you're, when every time you, every time you speak through your actions, what are you sharing? Are, what, what are, what are, what are you proclaiming through your actions? Is it hatred? Is it your political affiliation? Is it, is it just dominance? What, what are you sharing through your actions? Who do you, what kingdom do you belong to? There are only two kingdoms you can belong to, brothers and sisters. It's either you're for or you're against. That's it. You're, there is no more lukewarm. There is no more staying silent to the evil in our world. We have to stand up for what kingdom we belong to. We must serve. We are soldiers in the army and we got to fight. Uh, we have to die. We have to hold on the blood stain. You've heard this song we sing as kids. We have to hold it up until we die. We got to fight. We got to stand up for what is right. We got to stand up for the injustice that is in our community, in our nation. The racism that is prevailing through our society, we must stand against it. But not just the racism, everything that is evil. Don't just be picking and choosing now. Just because it's through media, just because people are posting all these different things. No, 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 no. We shouldn't have to take this in order us for us to stand up against it. We should be standing up against this. People should know us by the fruits of our labor. They should be able to distinguish who we are by our actions and the way we treat one another. And if you and I cannot treat another with brotherly love or sisterly love, how can I say I'm a part of the kingdom? Man. Do they know me more by whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat or maybe by the way I treat? Or maybe do they know me because, oh, that's the guy who, who really loves God. Oh, that's the guy who, man... I treated him terribly, but he treated me with such respect. Man, he he's not he's not forcing or shoving the Bible quotes down my throat, but he's just showing them 
what they mean and how to live by them. Love. Love. Love is what we should be proclaiming. Love stands against this. Love, honestly, to be honest, guys, last time I checked your Bible, Daniel chapter 2 says this is going to be demolished. And love does not force. Love does not coerce. Love is not trying to dominate, but love is trying to serve. We've already won the victory. Now we're just doing a victory lap. Makes sense. God's kingdom, it was lost, but it's been restored. Now it's our decision. God says, I put enmity between you. I've given you a choice. What will you choose? And for me, this is what I'm choosing every single day. And it's hard because honestly, guys, I've seen so many different things on Facebook, Instagram, the news, and it's hard to just stay focused on this sometimes. All this noise coming at me, all this evilness, and it's just prevailing in my mind. And I just had to stop. I, I said, I'm done with social media. I'm done with all of it. Honestly, I'm taking a break off of all of it. And I just need to focus on what is right and what is true. I need to. I need to. There's this concept of, of like, you know, these people who are trying to distinguish what are counterfeits and what are real when it comes to the dollar bill. And they tell you, just study the real thing, because if you know the real thing without a shadow of doubt, you will be able to tell what any other counterfeit there is. And that's what we need to do. We need to just study the real thing. And love is other centeredness. It's selflessness. It's humility. It's peaceful. It's patient. It's kind. It's faithful. It's gentle. It's courageous. It's strong. These are the things we need to study. These are the things we need to focus on. And these are the ways we need to treat one another. You know, Matthew 18 talks about a beautiful concept, principle to live by as Adventists and as Christians. If you have a problem with somebody, don't post it on Facebook. No, 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 no. Give them a call. Meet with them one on one. And then if they still, if that problem is still there, take Take an elder, take someone as a witness. And if there's still a problem, take some more people. And at that point, bring it to the church at large. You see, we bring our problems on Facebook and we post it like as if like as if people can't really see us and we can hide and coward. No, 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 no. If you have a problem, go talk to someone about it because love is not cowardice. Love is courageous. Love is strong. Love is not afraid to tell you, hey, you know, I had a problem with what you said. Can we talk about it? That's how we're supposed to treat one another with respect and love. And, 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 and love, yeah, love, love. We need to be more empathetic with our African brother, African, African American brothers and sisters who are in such pain and turmoil by the way they've been treated because of the color of their skin. It's disgusting. And we should stand strong with them. We need to during this time. And, and anybody else who's been discriminated against because of their sex, because of their color, because of their race, because of whatever, we should stand with them against that. Need to. Have to. Because that is what our kingdom is based on. Love. And love definitely stands against that. And so, this Sabbath, I encourage you to decide what kingdom you're a part of. And if you're truly a part of this kingdom, start to examine the way you treat your family, start to examine the way you treat your spouse, start to examine the way you treat your children. And if it is not with these principles, something needs to change. And I encourage you to start contemplating on these different things. And if you're desiring change, if you're desiring to, to find a way to replace this heart of self and to replace it with a heart of love, you know, to be honest, it's going to take a whole lot. And I want to go with that journey with you. And so if you are wanting to make that journey and make that change, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make an invitation for you to contact me, Pastor Rodell, an elder, a mentor. Find somebody you can talk to and say, hey, I don't like this part of my life. I want to change. What can I do? And let's go on a journey together. Because a journey, a journey together. Because a journey alone is let's do it together. And let's make that change. And, and continue, no matter what you post, no matter what you say, no matter what conversation you may spark up, may it always be founded and based 
on love. That is my encouragement for you this Saturday. And, and because, you know, you're not in church and it feels a little weird, I was talking to one of the members. Hey, guys, I know a beautiful way you can keep the Sabbath today and make it feel special. After the sermon closes and after you're like, okay, what should I do? Take your family. If it's not 170, 70 degrees outside, gosh, El Paso is terribly hot. This is awful. You know, I encourage you. Go find a, a random recipe on on internet and Google and try to cook a meal, something you've never cooked before. Try to make cookies, fresh cookies with your family. Make make cinnamon rolls. Just do something from scratch and just enjoy one another's presence. And if it's not too outside, go for a walk. Go to the mountains and sit. Turn off your phone. Leave it in the car and enjoy the presence of your wife and your family and just embrace one another with love and compassion and truly enjoy the fellowship we have on Saturday. Turn off that phone of yours. Turn off the TV. It doesn't mean you have to be bored out of your minds, but that's what we are. We are made to be in relationship with one another. And so I encourage you to do that. If you need any more ideas, y'all, I'm always here. I got a bunch of ideas. And I can tell you all the things that we can be doing on Sabbath rather than the things you can't be doing. Because that concept, it's whack. All the things we can be doing. So blessings to you. Let's pray. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to share this message of, of love and restoration. Be with my members, Lord. Be with each and every one of them. And be with those who are watching. Father, they're already family. No matter who they are, Lord, may they know that they're part of the covenant of love. They're part of a government of love. And Father, may we stand with those principles and stand against anything else that is not of love. Father, be with those who are protesting, protect them and keep them. Be with those who are looting and rioting, Father. Use their, you show them and reveal to them that that is not the way to go. Be with those who are the police officers and the first responders to all these different things. Give them peace and patience as they are having to deal with people's anger and rightly so. But Father, may those protesters and the cops find unity with one another. And may they realize they're both standing for the same thing. Be with our members and, and those who are also in pain. And Father, be with those who, who are just are so confused by all this. Give us understanding. Help us to have conversations. And help us to begin to know and realize that this place is not our home. This government will surely be destroyed when you come again. And Father, I can't wait because the kingdom that will be destroyed, Father, will be replaced by a kingdom that shall stand forever. And may my hope be founded in that and not in this. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Blessings to you guys and happy Sabbath.